Good evening. It's a great pleasure for us to be able to gather together today, and even more so, it's a pleasure because we have the opportunity to study the Word of God together. The main reason that we come to a meeting like this is because we have concerns. I have concerns. You have concerns. We are worried about the things that are going on. We're worried about things that are going on in this world. We're worried about things that are going on in our society. We're worried about things that are going on in our community. We're worried about things that are happening in our families. And we're worried about our own lives. There's this uncertainty. And that uncertainty tells us to draw for something. We're looking, searching. We want to find something, something that seems to be missing in our lives. And in this journey, as we search, there is a way to find a way out. There is a way to find clarity in what is going on. And in Scripture, we find such a person. There is in Scripture a man who really truly, honestly, was searching for something special in his life. He wanted something to fill the gap, to fill the voids in his life. And this man was going to see Jesus Christ. But he was concerned. You see, his journey to see Jesus would not be easy. In fact, his journey to see Jesus Christ would be fraught with peril because if somebody should see him, they would not like the fact that he's going to see Jesus Christ. And so this man begins to take his journey, and he does it very slowly. He does it a little bit in secret. He goes on different paths. He avoids contact with other people until finally he comes to the place where Jesus is. And now, in the presence of Jesus, there is he, Jesus is there, and between him and Jesus, there are these disciples. And the disciples see this man, and they want to stone him. Can you believe that? These disciples, they want to get rid of him. They say, get out of here. Go away from this place. What are you doing here? We find this man in Matthew chapter 8. It says, Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. What's a leper? Do you know what a leprosy is? Leprosy is an incurable disease. It has no way to be healed, and it is transmitted when you do something. In fact, if you're in the presence of a leper, would you give him a hug? No, you wouldn't give him a hug. Why not? You'd never give a leper a hug. Because you'd get leprosy. Leprosy is transmitted by, by touch. And here's this leper, sick. His body is rotting. Little bits and pieces of him are falling off. The flesh is dying. And this man comes to Jesus Christ. This man whose very body is falling apart. He's in the worst possible condition. He has a disease which cannot be cured. There is no way to cure this disease. And he comes in front of the presence of Jesus Christ. And he says to Christ these words. He says, in chapter 8 of the book of Matthew, verse 2, he says, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now imagine the scenario for the disciples who are watching this. There's the leper, incurable full of disease, and he's in the presence of Jesus, and he tells Jesus, if you will, if you will, you, you can make me clean. Does he demand cleansing? Does the leper go to Jesus Christ and say, I'm here, you promised to heal the sick, I'm here, heal me? Is this what the leper says? No. The leper says, Lord, if it is your will. If it's your will, you 
can make me clean. Can Jesus cure this leper? Is it possible for Jesus Christ to cure this leper? Of course it is. The leper can be cured. It says right here, the man asked for healing from the great healer. He comes to Jesus Christ and says, Lord, if thou wilt. Doesn't demand. He asks with humility, humbly comes before the Messiah and says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And what does Jesus Christ do? To the very astonishment of the disciples. In verse 3, it says that Jesus did something. Verse 3 says that Jesus put forth his hand and did what? What did he do to this leper? It says, that Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. How did Jesus cure this man? What was the instrument that he used to cure this man's leprosy? It says that he touched him. How is leprosy transmitted? What did we just say a moment ago? How do you get leprosy? How do you get leprosy? You get leprosy by touching somebody who's a leper. Did Jesus need to touch the leper to heal him? Did he need to touch him? Was it necessary for Jesus Christ to touch that leper that the leper should be clean? No. We have examples in Scripture of Jesus Christ healing at great distances. And yet here, to a disease which is transmitted by touch, Jesus Christ comes, and what does he do? He touches this man. The moment that Jesus Christ touched the leper, that moment, that same exact moment, at the instant that the leper was touched, what happened with this leper? He was made whole. The scripture says immediately his leprosy was healed. To the, to the disciples, this was an absolute shock. They could not believe that Jesus would touch the leper. And yet Jesus Christ, to set for them an example, to show us what he's willing to do for us, he touches that leper and makes him clean. Our world today is sick. The condition of our world, the condition of our society, the condition of our nation, the condition of our community, the condition of our families, our personal condition is sick. That's why we're here. We're here because we are sick and we are desiring to be cleansed. We want to be cleansed by Jesus Christ. And today, this evening, Jesus Christ is preparing to touch you and me. Sinners who are not living up to the honor and glory of God, Jesus Christ is willing to come and touch us. That's why we're here. We're here because we seek that in our lives. We feel the need of Jesus Christ because around us we can see the fulfillment of things that have already been ordained in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 24, we find that the disciples are concerned. And these concerned disciples, they come to Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 24, they're in the presence of Jesus. And they have a question for Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, it says that as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what sh when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? He said, Lord, we are concerned. We're concerned, Lord, because we feel that we need you. 
And so in this concern, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, as they turn back to on the projector, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, it says that Jesus Christ is sitting by himself. He's private, alone, sitting there. And he says, and, and the disciples come to him, and the disciples say, Lord, when will we know? Now, what was the condition when they came to Jesus Christ? What was their actual, did they come to him in public? Did they come to him at a time when other people were present? No. When did they come there? It says they came to see him privately. They were a little bit afraid to ask this question. They weren't going to ask just the question, you know, Lord, you know, when shall these things be? It says that they came to him privately and said, Lord, what are the signs of thy coming? And the Lord replies to them in this condition. And he says, when, when they said privately, what will be the signs of your coming? He says to them, I'll tell you. Verse 6, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Have you heard of wars? Have you heard of wars? I've heard of wars. In fact, from the time that Christ pronounced these words, there has never been a moment in human history where there has not been war. And wars have progressed over time. In fact, in our society today, we don't have wars like they used to have. You know, during the Crimean War, in the latter part of the previous century, the officers brought their wives and children to watch the war. They had this great battle. It was like a show. They actually brought their wives and children to watch the battle. War has progressed. In the last century, they decided that war was no longer just about armies. War was about everybody. And suddenly, war has been about slaughtering a mass of humanity. In our world today, there is enough armament supplied to destroy this entire world 800 times over. That's how much we have accumulated our arms and armaments today. And we live in this state of fear. We went from World War I to World War II to a Cold War, which was a state of war with no war, and now we're living in the war on terror, and guess what? We're all afraid, because we are in the war on terror. We live in this time that Jesus was speaking of. But he says that's not all. There's going to be Famine as well. Famine is a sign of his coming, he says in verse 7. Famine? Really? You had dinner today. I mean, we're living in America. You had dinner. What do you mean famine? What kind of famine do you have? Do you know that today in the United States, I'm not talking about Ethiopia. I'm not talking about Somalia. I'm saying right here in the United States, today, 30 million people will not eat dinner today. And of those 30 million, almost 10 million will be children. In America, today, right now, in the land of plenty, we are experiencing famine. Just recently, the World Food Program decided that they had to have a summit because they're running out of food. Our society is running out of food. And now we have to have this famine in our world today? We have famine. Oh, not only famine. The Lord says, there's another sign of my coming. The other sign that I'm coming soon is pestilence, disease, sickness. You know that it's the most interesting part of our social fabric, that we have more disease now than at any other time in human history. There are more people who need constant medical attention today than there were during the bubonic plague. Do you know that in the time of the black plague, when everything was really bad, and you know those examples in history of the man with the bell going through the street saying, bring out your dead, bring out your dead? There are more people sick per capita today than at that time. 
We don't heal stuff. We have a lot of medicine today. We have a lot of medicine, but we don't cure anything. What's the last thing that was cured? What's the last thing that you remember that was cured? You know what they invent today is they invent maintenance of disease. We don't cure diseases. We learn how to maintain disease. Our society, our culture cures nothing. What's the last thing that they cured? The last thing they cured was polio. Polio. Polio was cured before I was born, before anybody in this room was born. That's the last thing that medicine has cured. Medicine cures nothing today. We have more disease today than we ever have. The only difference is that we've developed drugs that help us cope with our diseases. We don't cure anything. The amount of disease in our world today is astounding. Did you know that more than 4 million Americans take more than 20 pills a day? A day. That's 4 million Americans take more than 20 pills a day. Can you believe that? In our society today, we are sick. We're sick. Pestilence is increasing. And now, the Lord says, but that's not all. It's not just going to be wars and disease and hunger. It's going to be more than that. You're going to see earthquakes in diverse places. Earthquakes are pretty common. In some parts of the world, they happen quite frequently. And yet, just recently, they were having earthquakes in the Midwest, which you don't really think of as an earthquake zone. And then they had an earthquake in off the coast of Hawaii. And then they had an earthquake in Chile. And now these earthquakes seem to be moving up that fault line until in this year, 2010, the California Fire Department, Cal Fire, the state fire department, was put on extra alert because seismologists were telling them that this year is finally going to be the big one. And I live in California. I like to pay attention to these things. Mm -hmm. I may be moving back to Virginia. <laughs> but in any case, the amount and frequency of these events is increasing. This is not an argument to scare anybody. These are facts that are happening in our world today. And yet, I'm not concerned about that. There may be wars that don't really affect me. There may be hunger, but I ate today. There may be disease, but I feel pretty good right now and I'm not on any medications, thank the Lord. I haven't experienced an earthquake in my life. And yet the Lord says that's not it. There's something else. We need to be watchful for. Verse 12 of Matthew 24 says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. If anything else tells us that we need to search for Jesus Christ, it is this fact. Our world today is cold. Our world today is stressed out. And cold. Did you know that the average American has no friends? That an actual American has no person that they're willing to confide in? Studies show that the average American surveyed when asked if there was another person that they could tell every single thing about their life to, the average American said no. They have nobody that they can talk to. They have nowhere to turn. Our society's closed in. My wife and I, you know how we communicate? I love my wife. You know how we communicate the most? We text each other. Mm -hmm. Have you ever texted? And we don't even text, I love you anymore. And it takes too long. Right? Just put in the little heart. There's a little thing you can put in the heart and just send that. Mm -hmm. I don't actually need to see anybody. I don't need to come in contact with anybody. And as a result, in our society, people are becoming sheltered. They're becoming isolated. And isolation, that feeling of loneliness, 
is killing mankind for themselves. So while we're alone, we're so worried now that we're constantly being stressed out in our society because we don't know what's going on. We have no idea what's happening. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so I get worried, and this amount of unease increases. I'm stressed out all the time. Most of you are stressed out all the time. And in fact, if you're a normal American, what you're going to do is you're going to go to your doctor and you're going to say, I'm stressed out. And you know what he's going to tell you to do? He's going to give you a pill that will calm you down. Why do Americans turn to these kind of solutions? Because something is missing in their lives. We're here because we found something. I want to share with you what I found. An assurance of salvation. An assurance that God's word can provide for you what nothing else can provide. A way to get away from stress. And yet, the average American won't. Do you know why we won't? Because we are too busy in our lives with other stuff. We are a drugged up culture. We are an alcohol soaked culture. We are a chained culture. Do you know that more Americans can name the Three Stooges than can name even two justices of the US Supreme Court? The average American, when asked how many houses of Congress there were, could not answer that question. But when asked who was the winner of last year's American Idol, they were ready to go. They knew American Idol. They knew who was the American Idol, but they had no idea in their lives. They had no idea what was happening. When you consider the culture in which we're living, you have to understand, you have to appreciate that we have needs and society has found an alternate way to find these needs. We have replaced reality with reality television. We have replaced assurance with doubt. We have replaced assurance of life with living somebody else's life. We live in a culture today where I was told that people would watch less television. A couple of years ago, I remember hearing that, you know what, television's dead. Television programming is dead. Everybody's going to be going into other things now. It's not going to be television programming anymore. We're going to be doing other stuff now. We're playing video games, watching movies, doing other stuff, but we won't be actually, you know, we won't be watching TV. Do you know that's not true? Americans watch more TV today than they have ever watched before because they don't have to actually sit down and watch it at the right time. They can TiVo it, DVR it, record it, they can get it at the library. Do you know that the average American library puts out, uh, rents out more DVDs and movies, TV shows, than it does books? Our system, our life, has been taken away from us. And it's been taken away from us with a purpose to distract us from what we need. It's been taken away from us because it wants to bind us. Our society wants to keep us prisoner. Our society wants to have us hooked up to things that will be of no relevance to us. And the reason that our society is doing this is because there is an enemy of souls and the enemy of souls does not want us to know what is actually going on. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, in the end of that chapter, it says, As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What were the days of Noah like? What was so bad about the days of Noah? It says that they were eating, they were marrying. What's wrong with that? Anything wrong with eating? 
No. Anything wrong with getting married? No. It's been a very enjoyable decade for me. So what was the problem then? It was not that they were living life. It was that they had forgotten that they had a deeper need. They had a need that was deeper than food, deeper even than human companionship. How did we get to this position? How did we get to the point we are right now? How is it that our society is so stressed out? How is it that our society is so unwilling to consider the Word of God? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In our society and in our culture, we have moved past the point of caring about God. And now, the things of this world have become paramount. You have to admit that you're sitting there today, right now, and you are watching this because you have a need. You feel a need. You feel that something is missing in your life. At the same time, the moment before you turned this on, the moment before you came to sit here today, you were thinking about earthly things. We are overburdened and overconsumed in our society with the things of this world. We care so much about the things of this world that the things of God have been put aside. I was talking with somebody recently, and I asked them, I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon? And this young person says to me, I believe. I said, that's wonderful. Do you believe that he could come today? He said to me, well, yes, I suppose he could come today. I said, would you want him to come today? Well, no, not really, not today. I said, but you believe that Jesus can come today? He said, yes, I believe. So, but you believe that Jesus can come today, but, but you don't want him to come today? Why not? He said, well, you know, I'm a really big soccer fan, and this year is the World Cup. I said, but you believe? He said, yes, I believe. I, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus is coming soon, but if only he would wait until August just so I know who's going to win the World Cup. And you laugh at this young man, and you do the same thing. You laugh at this young man, you laugh at the way he's living his life, and you do the same thing. We live our lives knowing that we need something. And Scripture gives us a way to find it, and at the same time, knowing what we need, we still live a life as if God was not here. The things of this world have become our love. That's our problem as a society. We have forgotten that Scripture tells us that there is an absolute moral right and wrong. Our society has become a society where everything is okay. Our society has become a society where everything is questioned. Is questioning wrong? No, I should study to show myself approved. But there is an absolute right, and there is an absolute wrong. Where can I find this? I find it in the law of God. And prophecy tells us that there is a people who will fulfill this. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, these people are called his saints. They're called his saints because they keep the commandments of God and they have something else. They have the faith of Jesus. Have you grabbed hold of this in your life? The prophecies that we are studying in this series, each and every one of them, the Lord wrote so that we would make our decision to commit our lives to him. 
every single prophecy in this series, every single presentation you will hear is designed with one purpose, to help you come to Jesus Christ. The Lord did not tell his disciples those things in Matthew 24 to scare them. He told them those things so that they could know, be cognizant of what is happening in society, and appreciate what it meant to live their lives in such a way that they were completely bound up together with him. You can have that life. You can have a life where Jesus Christ is living in you. In order to live that life, where do you need to turn? In John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In these studies, we want to open the word of God. We want to share together what the Lord has written. Why were these prophecies recorded for us? For what purpose? To sanctify us. To show us what is the truth. The truth, my dear friends, is Jesus Christ. That's why we have the word. The word is given to us that each and every one of us might take hold of Jesus Christ. And as a result, be sanctified by him. When I study prophecy, every time that I understand a verse that I didn't understand before, you know what happens? My faith is confirmed. Every time that I look at a prophecy and that prophecy is revealed, I thank God that by his grace, he has shown me the way of things to come. The Lord has given us these things that we might have an assurance of him. In many languages, the book of Revelation is called apocalypse. Right? The end, finishing, it's a terrible word, apocalypse. In English, we have a better title for the last book of the Bible. We call it Revelation. Why do we call it Revelation? We call it Revelation because God wants to reveal it to you. In this series, what you're going to see is Jesus Christ in prophecy. What you're going to see is Jesus Christ revealed to us so that we can be sanctified by him. The only question we need to ask then is, are we prepared for that, or do we need to rush home tonight because we have to watch CSI? What is important in your life? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it tells us that when we take hold of the word of God, something starts to happen in our lives. Something begins to happen when you will take hold of the words that are going to be shared with you throughout this series. Something is going to happen in your life. The Apostle Paul describes it this way. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. As I take hold of this word, as the revelation is opened up to me, as the revelation is opened up to you, what's going to start to happen in your life? There's this washing that takes place. Washing? What kind of washing? Washing what? What's my problem? I am clean. I took a shower. I used soap and shampoo and all that stuff. What's my problem? My problem is not hygiene. My problem is that my life is so bound up with this world and the things of this world that I have lost sight of God. And around me are happening momentous events. Do you understand that things are happening around you right now in this country to take away your liberty? Do you know that things are being prepared right now in this country for you to be a slave? And yet, we're too busy trying to figure out the things of this world. We are so busy trying to figure out who's going to win the World Series that we forgot 
that there is a Savior who wants to touch us. In this world today, we are so filled up with these things that the Lord says we need the Word. We need to study these prophecies because we need to expose ourselves to the Word so that as we expose ourselves to the world, what is going to start to happen? All of a sudden, the things of this world begin to be washed away. Some people, they approach the Word. They've got a little bit of the world spotted on them. And they open the Word. And as they're exposed to the Word, Jesus Christ cleanses them. And they begin to be washed away from these sins. But there are some of us who need thorough cleaning. There are some of us who are so bound up with the things of this world that a scrub brush is required. When I was growing up, our grandmother, my grandmother moved in with us after grandpa died and, and uh, there wasn't really that much need for her to live alone. She moved to the city. Uh, it's my mother's mother. And she moved to the city and now we shared a bathroom. My brother and I shared a bathroom with grandma. And grandma put something in the, in the shower which I hadn't seen before. It was this, this brush kind of thing, you know, to brush your back. And I don't know, we didn't really use that as boys. You know, we didn't use it. But then she had this brush, right? And uh, I remember I was, I was really I early teenage years. And uh, I see this thing, and I'm in the shower, and I'm like, why not? Right? Why, why not? You know, so I, uh, I, I, I could wash my back. That, that's a good idea. I should wash my back. And I take this thing, and I put it, oh, it was sharp. I don't even know how grandma uses this. I was like, Some of us need that. Our lives have become so bound up with this world that we need a thorough cleansing. The Word of God can do this. Come here every night. Come here every night of this series for one purpose, to be washed by the Word of God. There is an end. When will this end be? Because there is an end. Clearly, Scripture tells us that this situation cannot continue. People going further and further away from God, this situation, it cannot continue. So when will it end? We are told today that we live in a world of change. In the last election, we were told to vote for change. And it's a change that we could believe in. You know how much changed in these two years? Since that election, how much changed? Nothing. Right? That's some cosmetic changes. But our society is just as bad as it was two years ago. You want change? There is only one place to get change. The only place to get change is in the Word. That's it. There's nowhere else that you're going to get change. We live in a society where the churches are telling people a cheap gospel. We live in a society where the churches, the popular churches, big churches, mega churches, are telling people that they're sinners. Is that true? Are we sinners? We are. And the churches of today are getting thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people to come forward and say that they are sinners. And these people are coming forward and saying that they are sinners. And do you know what the popular churches are saying? That's good. You're saved. What? What kind of cheap gospel is this? When you are exposed to the gospel, what is it going to do to you? It's going to change you. The gospel found in the word of God is not a cheap gospel. If you accept to study the word of God with us, be prepared for actual change. Because the things that you will study in the course of this week, these things produce actual change. Because as you're exposed to the word, what happens? You get washed. 
you're going to come here and you are going to be washed by the word. This is a change that you can believe in. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, notice carefully a prophecy which was given right at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It says, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall do what? He shall save his people what? He shall save these sinners? Is this the prophecy? Does it say he shall save these sinners? Does it say he shall save these people in their sins? What does it say here? That cheap gospel church that you are going to, remember that the Lord has not called you to be saved as you are. He accepts you as you are, in whatever condition you are in. And then what does he want to do? The Lord wants to change you. He wants to take that sin away. He wants to take those earthly desires away from you. He wants to create in you something new. The Lord was prophesied to come here for one purpose, and that was to save you from your sins. How will this happen? How will this happen? In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. What's going to happen to you as you come here week after week, day after day, exposing yourself to the word of God, what's going to happen in your life? The more you expose, the more you walk with Jesus Christ, the more you will be changed. Jesus Christ is preparing right now to cleanse you. The only question is, are you prepared to be cleansed by him? We need to be ready. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus is not going to wait for this season of your favorite sport to finish. Jesus is not waiting for this season of your favorite show to finish. Jesus is not waiting for you to get a certain amount of money. Jesus is preparing to come right now. The only question is whether or not you are prepared for him to come. What we're going to study in this series is specifically designed to attract us to the one who is coming again. He came already to set an example for you and me. And he is coming again to take home those that have followed after this example. In Luke chapter 21, verse 34, it says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unaware. Are you ready? That day is coming. And if you are not using this moment to prepare yourself, you will be found not ready. You will be left when others go to meet Jesus Christ. I don't want that for me. And I don't want that for anyone else. Because I want you to experience the joy of Jesus Christ in your lives. This is why the leper came. The leper was sick. The leper was diseased. But he said, I don't care. I don't care about my condition. I need to go. I need to go right now. I need to find Jesus Christ. 
I, it doesn't matter that other people are going to try and stone me. It doesn't matter that people are going to try and stop me from meeting Jesus Christ. I will meet my Savior. And with determination, he goes and he meets Jesus Christ. You have that opportunity. You are sick. You're full of sin. You're stressed out. Your life is not where it's supposed to be. You have problems, troubles in your life. Doesn't matter. Right now, at this moment, before we can step one foot into the prophecy that we will study, you need to make a decision. You need to decide, Lord, you can make me king. If you will, Lord, you can do this. If you make that decision in your life right now, the rest of these studies, all they're going to do is bring you closer and closer to Jesus Christ. But unless you're willing to give your heart to him, the next study that you're going to receive is going to be a theory. It's going to be a doctrine. And it won't change who you are. We want change, real change. Because if you give your heart to the Lord today, at this moment, right now, if you give your heart to the Lord, do you know what he's prepared to do right now? In the condition that you're in, right now, exactly as you are, do you know what he's willing to do? Jesus Christ, right now, at this moment, is willing to do for you what he did for the leper. He's willing to come to you in the condition that you are in, and he's going to do something right now, tonight. He's ready to reach out and touch you. Do you want Jesus Christ to touch you? Don't wait. Do not wait. Famous hymn writer who wrote many of the hymns in our hymn book that we sing from all the time. He was dying. And he had a disease which was quite debilitating. It had caused him physical changes and alterations. He had blotches on his body. He was weak and he was in bed dying. His friends heard that he was dying. And so they began to come to visit him. And when they would arrive at his home, when they would arrive at his home, his wife would tell them, uh, well, I'll tell him that you're here. And she would go up to the room and she would tell him, your friend so-and-so is here. This hymn writer, who was also a pastor, he would tell her, thank them very much for coming. Send them home. And one person, and another person, and another person came, and always the answer was the same. Thank them for coming. Send them home. His fellow pastors came. The members of his congregation came, and he would say, send them home. Now, he also had another friend, not from his congregation, not a fellow pastor. His other friend was Robert Ingersoll, a very famous atheist of his time. Robert Ingersoll also came to pay his respects, and he'd heard from others that this is what you did. You went there, and then the wife would, you know, go upstairs, she'd come back, and then you'd go. So he came prepared to leave very quickly. He arrived at the house. The wife went upstairs. She came back downstairs, and she said, he will see you. Hmm? Ingersoll was shocked. He went up to the room. They began to talk, to share stories. The pastor used the opportunity to try and share with him a little bit more of the word. But Ingersoll kept, he was so distracted, he could not understand why this pastor had not wanted to see any of his friends. Why would he want to see an atheist in his dying hours? He doesn't want to see fellow pastors who could give him comfort. Why? 
Finally, he cannot control himself anymore, and he says, why? Why did you want to see me? The pastor replied, them, I will see them again. But for you, I am afraid I will never see you again. I don't want that to be your case. I want to be in heaven with you. I want to know that you've given your heart to the Lord. I want to know that you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in your heart as I have. We're here because we want that experience. In 2 Corinthians, It says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're prepared to give your heart to Jesus Christ, if you're prepared right now to have that experience, I invite you to stand up together with me and sing this hymn. It's a well-known hymn. The words say, I have decided to follow Jesus. How many of you today have made that decision? How many of you today are ready to stand up together with me and sing these words? I have decided to follow Jesus. This is my wish and prayer for each and every one of us today. Amen.